You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 14. The Real Mom Nutrition Perspective on Snacking. Today I'm talking with Sally Kuzemchek, blogger over at Real Mom Nutrition. We dish on keeping it real, keeping it fun, and keeping a perspective on feeding your kids, especially when it comes to snacking. Sally will cover her brand new Snacktivist Handbook, a book she is publishing, which is available on her website, realmomnutrition.com, which gives you the tools to handle all the snacking environments outside of the home your child will encounter. You can find today's show notes at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 014. That's 014 for episode number 14. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey everyone, Jill here. Welcome back to the Nourish Child Podcast. I'm so glad you're here, and I hope you've been having a wonderful week. I was up in Syracuse, New York at Syracuse University this week speaking with a large group of parents, coaches, and athletes about sports nutrition for the young athlete. And while I was there, I got to see my daughter, who was a student there, and spend a little time with her. So that was definitely the highlight of my week. I'm also gearing up for the Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo, which we lovingly refer to as FENCI, in Boston next week, where I will be speaking along with my colleague, who is a uh, speech and language therapist, Melanie Potok, who runs the website My Munch Bug. She and I will be discussing ARFID, which is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder otherwise known as extreme picky eating, and how to manage that if you happen to be a nutrition professional or speech professional or occupational therapist or any other type of healthcare professional who are working with these children, how you can set your practice up and collaborate with a team of health professionals to help these kiddos along the road to expanding their palate and nourishing their bodies well. So I'll be in Boston speaking uh, about that topic with Melanie on Sunday. So I'm looking forward to that. Another piece of very exciting news is that the Nourish Child podcast was called out in an article on U.S. News & World Report, Eat Plus Run, as one of the 10 nutrition podcast you should be listening to. So, of course, I was so honored and delighted to be included in that list with some really fabulous podcasters. If you would like to check out those podcasts, I'm going to include that link to the article with the list of 10 podcasts you should be listening to in the show notes. So you can go and explore and get your ears full of information about nutrition. Today, I am so excited to have Sally Kuzemchek of Real Mom Nutrition on the podcast with me. Sally is a registered dietitian, educator, author, and mom who blogs about feeding kids and staying sane at realmomnutrition.com. She writes about nutrition for national magazines, blogs weekly for Parents Magazine, and collaborated with Cooking Light on the book Dinner Time Survival Guide, a cookbook for busy families. She and I were a ton of topics, mostly about keeping your perspective when feeding your children. We talk about snacking. We talk about her new book called The Snacktivist's Handbook, which will be available on her website, realmomnutrition.com. And we just talk about our own kids and some of our funny situations or challenging situations that we have encountered as moms. And it's a fun interview. I hope you really enjoy it. I'll include uh, many of the links that we discuss in the podcast in this episode on the show notes where you can download those or explore those links a little bit further. They'll be included 
at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 014. That's 014 for episode number 14. So without further ado, let's dig into this interview with Sally from Real Mom Nutrition. Hey, Sally, welcome to the Nourish Child podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad you're here. I am a huge fan of yours. I've known you for a while. I actually remember when your when your blog first came out. And for listeners, it's Real Mom Nutrition. RealMomNutrition.com is where you can find it. And uh, I know you're very famous for keeping a uh, very realistic uh, perspective on pretty much all things that happen in your life. I understand you have your little dog at your feet and... <laughs> I would never have my dogs at my feet during a podcast. We'll probably hear them in the background because they like to bark and they like to they like to talk just like me. That's right. Um, but I know you also have a wonderful sense of humor, and I think for you know I always wonder when people have such a great perspective and great sense of humor, is that what carries you through day to day, even when you know things can get frustrating or tiresome or even worrisome. Well, it's funny because it's not that I always have a great sense of humor in that moment, but sometimes looking back on it, I can see the humor in it. So I started Real Mom Nutrition about seven years ago when I I had my first child, or actually I had two kids, and I just felt like, gosh, uh, this is a lot harder than I feel like it's being made out to be. You mm -hmm. know, when you pick up a magazine or you go to a blog and... And I felt like, gosh, I want to tell the truth. I want to pull back the curtain and let people know that that it can be really hard, too. Even mm -hmm. if you have initials after your name, like we do, mm -hmm. that sometimes it's hard and things don't come naturally. And so part of the way I convey that is through humor. And I have always been a big fan of laughing at myself and at situations that I find myself in. And I think everything can end up being a funny story. So even if you can have like the most embarrassing thing happen to you or the most frustrating thing, it can eventually turn into a story that, that makes somebody laugh or makes somebody, you know, just chuckle and say, you know what, I've been there. Or gosh, she can really relate to what, what's going on with me. Right. And when I started telling those stories on my blog, I found that my readers really responded to that and that's what they really wanted to hear and so um, I'm more than happy to share those things with them so yes I definitely have moments like everyone else where I'm sitting at the kitchen table like you know with my head in my hands just <laughs> like I just spent an hour making this meal and now no one really likes it mm -hmm. and so in that moment I don't always have the best sense of humor but later I can reflect on it and laugh and then go to my readers with a story like you know what if this has happened to you you are not alone. I have been there. Or picky eaters. Absolutely, I've been there. So, right. Um, so that's how I use humor. Yeah, and I, I actually think I just recently saw a picture of you with your head in your hands at the dinner table <laughs> on your blog. <laughs> yes, my child took that like, picked up the camera and took that picture of me, and I found it later. You know how I don't oh. know if your kids have ever done that. You find these pictures of yourself, like, oh, I guess he took a picture of me. And I put it on my blog as I thought it was just this this total moment of just me with with my just tired at the end of the day mm -hmm. at the table with my my head in my. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty pretty exciting for your kids to snap that shot. I'm sure. Right. So so funny. So Sally, what what would you say is the funniest story you've told on your blog or on Facebook that? you know, people have really responded to? Well, I have um, two funny stories that are very much the same that involve my second child, who is like the the family comedian. Every family needs one. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's the one where, you know, you have your first child and you think like, oh, I've, I've done everything right. And then you have the second one. And you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so he, um, he loves sugar and sweets of all kinds. And we were in the grocery store, and he was like a toddler. I think he was maybe two or maybe three. Mm -hmm. And of course, we go to we go down the aisle with the cereal, and you know how all those sugary cereals are placed right at you know children's eye levels. Mm -hmm. And he's walking down the aisle with me, and he grabs onto a box of sugary cereal, 
you know, I said, you know, we're not going to buy that today. Let, let's find something else. You know, I'm all calm and whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he really wanted the cereal and wanted the cereal. And he ended up, and, it, you know, it was, yeah, he was a toddler, so he was, like, not, not to be reasoned with. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to take the cereal away, and he ended up chewing a hole through, like, <laughs> running down the aisle and chewing a hole through the box. <laughs> He did a similar thing when we were at Panera one day for lunch. There's those huge cookies that are wrapped in cellophane by the yeah. register. And, you know, of course, can I? Can we have one? And I said, you know, we're not going to get a cookie today. Mm-hmm. And he grabbed one and <laughs> right through it, right through the cellophane. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, both were, like, very humbling. Like, here I am, the dietitian mom, um, and my son is chewing a hole through the sugary cereal box to get uh, to the sugary cereal. And, you know, some people might say, like, oh, it's because you deprive your kids of sugar. And I absolutely do not. If you follow me on a regular basis, you know that. Right. But it was just one of those humbling parent moments that, like, even when you think you're doing everything right, your kids can do this, like, super embarrassing thing. So oh, it's yeah. not that pe- people just respond to that because we've all been there where something like that has happened. And you just, like, slink out of the, you know, I paid for the cookie but then had them throw it away at Panera. But you just kind of slink out, like, okay, Mother, Mother of the Year Award. I can't think of a particularly funny story, but I always tell my people that I'm with counseling or whatever, I'm like, you put any of the junk food or the soda or whatever in front of my kids, they'll all go for it. They are not, you know, they, they're they normal kids. Normal kids, ha- it's hard to refuse that kind of stuff. Well, that's what I, th- I feel like. I, I get sometimes frustrated when people think that their kids shouldn't want that stuff. Yeah. And they almost feel irritated that their kids like it. And, you know, I say to people, just like you said, like, of course they do. Like this stuff is engineered yeah. to excite our senses. Like it's it's not it's not that you failed as a parent somehow because your kids pref- you know your kids don't prefer like kale to a cupcake. It's just natural human instinct and food engineering, frankly. Yeah, it is. It is, and yeah, there's it's it's hard, no doubt. It's hard, but if yeah. you can find the funny and the perspective in it, it it makes it much easier. That's right. Oftentimes in motherhood especially with cooking and and feeding a family, it, it's oftentimes a thankless job. And I even now I'm down to two kids. Two of my kids are in college and I have two kids home. And I even said last night, you know, I made this huge meal. Somebody needs to help me clean it up. I need some help. And uh, I think it's a, a really can be a very frustrating, thankless job for parents sometimes during that whole course of, of growing a family. So what advice would you give to parents who have perhaps lost their sense of humor or who may not have a sense of humor around food and feeding or a positive perspective on feeding their kids? What what advice would you give them? So I think that sometimes we get so mired down in the everyday, and I think that's true with all things in parenting. You know, when you're, no matter what you're dealing with, so, you know, your child refuses to go on the potty and you just obsess about it and think you, you don't have any perspective and you think like he's going to go off to college in diapers you know you, you don't right. have the perspective and I think that's true with, with feeding kids is that we're so mired down in the in the bite to bite meal to meal that we kind of lose uh, track of the big picture and I think being having been an extreme picky eater has sort of helped me see that through my kids eyes Mm -hmm. because I see okay they're not going to want peanut butter jelly every single day this is this is a phase this will pass they will get older their taste buds will change peer pressure positive peer pressure will will you know crop up and different things will happen that will change how they eat. They will not mm-hmm. always eat this way. And I see that all the time with my kids, and I'm always sharing those stories with my readers because I want them to I want to encourage them. So I shared a story the other day about my younger son with guacamole. So mm-hmm. I love homemade guacamole and make it like every single week. <laughs> and there was one night a couple years ago, I put a little smear on his quesadilla of, of guacamole and he cried and wouldn't think about touching it, tasting it, anything. Was so upset by this guacamole. Mm-hmm. And the other day he asked 
to make guacamole together with me so he could have some. So, you mm-hmm. know, and that's just in the span of maybe a year, year and a half, he went from crying over it to asking me to make it with him so he could eat it. Mm-hmm. And that was with absolutely no pressure on my part. It was just exposure. He saw us eating it every week. He saw me making it. Mm-hmm. He saw us talking about how much we liked it. And so I think if, if you're so frustrated by your kids, you need to take that step back, take a breath. Think about the long term. Think about what your long term goals are. You wrote that great post, guest post on my blog about thinking about your long term goals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not, your goal should not be, I want him to eat three bites of that quesadilla with uh, guacamole on it. It should be, I want him to eventually try guacamole on his own and maybe, just maybe, (laughs) he might like it. Even like it, yeah. No, that's such a great, it's such a great perspective because. I totally agree with you. I think we're very short-term focused society in general with everything and particularly with feeding children, you know, we want those quick successes right away and we're not really in it for the, we are in it for the long haul, but we may not have that perspective that keeps us going for the long haul. And I think that that is oftentimes where the frustration sets in is this lack of results. We're a very result-focused society. But that's such a great story because it can take such a long time. And I always remind parents, too, that, you know what, we don't all like every food on the planet. I don't like every food on the planet. So you have to always keep in your mind that your child might not ever like broccoli or green beans. And that's okay, too. There's a gazillion foods out there that your child can like. Over time. You know, I, you've probably heard that whole stat, and I think it came from one study about it can take 15 to 20 exposures mm-hmm. of a food or something. But I think, unfortunately, that that statistic or that study finding has been used in such a way that parents expect that, mm-hmm. okay, all I have to do is put this thing on the table for 15 to 20 times, and then he's going to magically start eating it and liking it. And I always say, like, hey, it could take it, it could take 15 exposures, two exposures. It took take 20 years and mm-hmm. that, you know that's okay I think you need to respect your child's um, timetable on that I didn't start eating certain foods until I was in my 20s and 30s mm-hmm. um, it took me that long and I'm not saying that's ideal because it's not but I think that if you have a child who is a, a really picky eater that you cannot force them mm-hmm. and you have to respect respect their tastes and preferences to some degree absolutely i As a side note, I worked on a project um, on picky eating called Teachable Tastes, and I worked with Sherry Fraker. She is a feeding specialist, and she wrote the book or co-authored the book Food Chaining. And one of her things is, is that she says, you know, yes, that stat, that research says 15 to 20, but that's for your average picky toddler who is just normally moving through the phase of picky eating. That does not apply to a child who might be an extreme picky eater, who might have sensory issues, who might have learning or behavioral challenges. Those kids can take 50 plus, you know, year, they can take 50 plus exposures up to years and or may never warm up to a certain food. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is very interesting how we glom on to some of these quick fix messages. Oh, if I just do it 15 times, my child will definitely eat broccoli. (laughs) The other thing that comes up a lot is snacking. And I feel like you, you know, you have such a great perspective on snacking and have done so much work in that area. And, you know, I do feel like that is like the Achilles heel for, for a lot of parents. I see in my practice, just on my own blog and my own, you know, speaking and talking with, with parents that, you know, the snacking really bothers families. So what, what are you what's your bottom line advice or your bottom line perspective on keeping it real with snacking and kids? I think two things. I think you have to think about snacks at home and then snacks outside of the home. And I think for snacks in the home, um, well, let me back up. So I started this campaign on my blog called Snacktivism, and mm-hmm. it's 
really about activism around snacks. Mm -hmm. And it started about because I was uh, a new soccer mom and when my child, my first son was like maybe five and started soccer and I did, had no idea that it was this endless parade of junk food after every game. I mm -hmm. was just standing there like, oh my gosh, I had no idea and I just let it happen all season. I didn't say anything. And then I thought, uh, it was I think the last game and the coach brought Oreos, cupcakes and fruit punch. Mm for them after their game and and for the siblings too you know and um the kids are all running around and i remember this one little boy had two oreos in each hand and i just thought what are we doing what what is what is this what what, what are we doing to our kids this makes no sense mm -hmm. and so after that i sort of vowed to to you know make a change on my kids teams and hopefully in the community and then hopefully through my blog but then when I started working on this I was like you know what I have to take a good hard look at what my kids are getting at home too mm -hmm. and so then I started to realize gosh my kids are snacking way too much and and I'm using snacks and this is granted when they were younger I was using snacks for more than just nourishment. So you know when you're out and about with a toddler and you have your no, you know, your arsenal of snacks in your bag because what if they get bored at the <laughs> at Target? What if they're they start getting hungry at library story time and you don't have anything and you're so worried they're gonna pitch a fit or your day's gonna be ruined or your errands are going to be curtailed by hunger. Mm -hmm. And so you know, you overpack all these snacks and I think at least I was very guilty of that and I realized that my kids were just snacking too much and not always on the highest quality things you know the the goldfish and the things things like that that were just easy to grab the mm -hmm. little puffs when they were toddlers and stuff and so then I started thinking that I needed to rein in snacking a little bit and um, think about the quality of the snacks because they were out and about in the world and they were getting a lot of I don't know just nutritionally poor snacks when they were, you know, in various places like parties and friends' houses and soccer or whatever it was. And so I needed to really make sure that the snacks at home were, were pretty darn nourishing mm -hmm. because they were getting that stuff elsewhere. So I kind of tried to implement a few strategies at home. I really, like with pre-dinner, that was a huge change for us. My young, my little one, he um, was just filling up on snacks constantly before dinner and then wouldn't eat his dinner. Right. And um, and then I started just doing, okay, just veggies in the hour before dinner. If you want a snack, you can snack on veggies. And that really changed things a lot for, for us mm -hmm. um, because he was actually then coming to the table hungry. And I think sometimes kids are snacking so much and their parents are like, gosh, he won't eat any of his lunch or dinner. He's so picky. He's driving me crazy. And it may not be that he's picky. It may just be that he's full from snacking. Right. So right. I think that we really need to take a look at the snacks they're getting elsewhere and at home. And those are kind of two separate yeah. issues to tackle. Yeah. One of the one of the things that I see in school age children and middle school kids is that they're light loading. I call it light loading in the morning and lunchtime where they're not really eating a really well-rounded, nutritious breakfast, and they might rush through lunch and not, you know, eat a full lunch. But then they come home and they are starving, and I call that backloading. So if you're, if you're, the majority of your nutritional intake is happening at from three o'clock into the evening, you're basically backloading your calories. And I always help try to help families flip that and really front load because it really helps normalize the appetite later in the day. And then of course, having those boundaries and that structure set up with snacks as you as you said, really looking at the types of snacks you're offering and when you're offering them can really help with your strategy in terms of feeding your children and nutrition, but also it helps them develop good habits, not bad habits. Yeah, and I think with, at least with my children, when you talk about that um, front loading, I really have to encourage my kids to to get those really nourishing foods at breakfast or lunch. Because I don't know about your kids, but my boys mm -hmm. tend to go for just starchy carbs, starchy mm -hmm. carbs. You know, they want they want toast and they want cereal, and I always have to be sort of pushing protein. Like, okay, let's get a glass of milk, let's get some yogurt. How about an egg? And I think those kinds of foods will help them at breakfast and lunch to not be quite so yes. crazy ravenous yeah. after school. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, my girls are light loaders. I have to push them. But my boy, he he wants like the full meal, pancakes, <laughs> eggs, bacon. <laughs> I'm like, you're wearing me out, son. <laughs> All right, so t- let's talk a little bit more. I know you're working on a handbook around snacktivism, so let's tell my listeners a little bit more about that because I think that's going to be a huge help to a lot of people. Sure. So as I mentioned before, I started this campaign called Snacktivism, which is activism around snacks, and it just started with my own experience on that soccer field and going to the coach uh, at the start of the next season and saying, hey, can we, I'm concerned about the snacks I'm seeing, can we switch to fruit and water only, or can we just eliminate the snack? Mm -hmm. And we ended up switching to just fruit and water. The coach was actually, this was a different coach than (laughs) my first, the first season we had. So Mm -hmm. he, he, his response was, gosh, I'm so glad you brought this up. I couldn't agree more. And and then the team parents just rotated bringing fresh fruit all season, and the kids really loved it, and nobody complained, and nobody asked where the chips were or the donuts or whatever it was. And so then after that, I just continued to do it, and I wrote about it on my blog, and I started posting resources for other parents to do the same. So I started posting like a sample email that you could send to the coach, a sample mm-hmm. email you could send to parents, a, a suggested snack list, different ideas. And, you know, I started doing the same thing at my child's summer camp then. Then I approached the camp director because they were getting sports drinks and uh, cereal bars every day as their snack. And Mm -hmm. so, again, just approached the director and talked to her about it, and and they made changes. And so then I have just sort of started compiling all these resources on my blog, and it's something that I've found over the years that really strikes a chord in parents. And... Food, as you know, when we talk about how we feed our kids, what we feed our kids, it's a super emotional topic for mm-hmm. people. Yeah. And people and those emotions can range from, you know, like frustration to anger um, and to resentment when somebody else tells you how to feed your kids or right. how, what kinds of foods you should be bringing. So no doubt that this is a highly charged emotional topic, Mm -hmm. um, especially when you're trying to suggest changes to things and they've been a certain way for a long time. You know, people think, well, we always bring donuts to the soccer field and then someone comes along and (laughs) with the change Mm -hmm. and it doesn't always go over well. So I heard stories from people over the years and I've been doing this about five years through my blog and just kind of collecting all these ideas and resources and I decided to compile them all into an ebook and it's called the Snacktivist's Handbook and it goes has different chapters for different settings. So there's a chapter for sports, uh, for school, there's a section for preschool, there's a camp chapter. There's a chapter on snacks at home, and there's actually a little bonus chapter at the end about snacks in the workplace. Because mm-hmm. I say, as I say in the ebook, uh, the workplace can be as tricky as a pee wee soccer sideline when it comes to sugary, junky food. And I hear those stories from my husband about all the donuts that come in, and the you know dishes of candy, and the different things that people, the birthday cakes, mm-hmm. and you know all of that. And so the handbook is really designed for people who want to make a change and create a healthier snack culture, snack environment for their kids as well as for all the other kids. And so I give parents those sort of concrete resources. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, you're a dietitian and it's easy for you. And in one respect, I I agree that sometimes when you have that certification, that qualification, that people will listen to you. But what I wanted to do was arm people with the facts, you know, the, the, the sources to back up those facts so that they could approach the powers that be and create change um, in their community. So I have bunches of printables. I have snack lists. I have FAQs that actually have documentation for all the sources. So if anybody wants to look up Whether kids, you know, peewee athletes, whether they need sports drinks, they can look and see. This comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And I have just tons of resources and ideas for parents in there to create change. And I think that 
that can be a real source of frustration and tension for parents in their communities. And so I wanted to find a way to, to help them through it. Yeah, that's that's going to be so great because all of, I mean just the chapters. I'm smi- I'm smiling at all these questions. The chapters that you described, camp, preschool, these are the questions I get as well. It's just like p- parents are and you're right, it's highly emotionally charged to the point where I'm curious as to whether you had any sort of negative experiences during the time when you were helping your community uh, change. I did. I had a, a, a kind of a bad experience, and it, but it taught me a lot. And, I, and I've learned a lot over these last five years, too, which um, I, I definitely put that wisdom into this, this ebook too. Mm-hmm. So I was on the soccer field one Saturday. This was a couple years ago. And I was just seeing donuts everywhere, and not on our team, because luckily every season – I've been able to talk with a coach, and we've either eliminated the snack or or done fruit. But I think it was uh, just seeing the other teams in the community and seeing just tons and tons of donuts. And I just was in a bad mood, and I came home. And, you know, you should never go on social media when you're in a bad mood. (laughs) And um, I went on Facebook, and I said, I think that my – I think I said something like, I think my neighborhood – soccer league is single-handedly supporting the frosted donut uh, industry today or something really snarky that I should mm-hmm. not have said mm-hmm. and of course I have a lot of people in my community who follow me on Facebook and read my blog and someone had seen that and her mother had brought donuts and I, I didn't even realize we were playing their team but her mother oh. you know it was the grandma who wanted mm-hmm. to bring the donuts and you know and and please her grandchild and you know of course sure. what grandma doesn't want to what doesn't want to do something like that and um this and she was my she's my neighbor mm. and um it really hurt her feelings mm-hmm. and she commented on facebook and then all of a sudden there were all these people in my community kind of piling on oh. and i realized okay there's a group in my community that definitely does not agree with me on this and felt that I wasn't being kind. And what I learned from that, and I realized, gosh, you know what? That was snarky, and that was uncalled for, and I shouldn't have said that. And I ended up getting together with this woman, and we had coffee one day, and we just kind of talked through it. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, she gave me her perspective, and I gave her mine, and it was a great way. It could have just ended as, a, as some, um, you know, as a conflict on Facebook, but Mm -hmm. we actually met face to face and talked about it, which was great. And uh, you know what I learned from that is, is you just can't make this a personal issue. And so that's why I always say, you know, like, do this at the beginning of the season, talk to your coach before the first game, because once the first game has start, once you've had the first game and someone's brought cupcakes, you just can't go in and say, hey, guys, Right. Let's right. not bring cupcakes. Let's do fresh fruit because it's healthier because then all of a sudden you've placed a judgment on those parents that brought that first snack. And, mm-hmm. you know, this is the, the great irony is that I was so busy writing this ebook that it didn't even occur to me that my kids coaches this this season might not be. Um, I didn't even occur to me to go to them because now that we're getting into the older leagues, snacks are kind of disappearing, luckily. Mm hmm. And I just kind of had, again, had to find the humor in it that this season, both of the coaches, the, the, they're bringing, you know, um, snacks that are not fruit. <laughs> and I just had to laugh because it didn't even occur to me to contact them. I'm so busy writing the book. And I thought, well, isn't that ironic? But yeah. um, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to post negative comments. I'm not. I'm just going to let it happen and then talk to them before the spring season. And I really think that that is that's the way to go because you just can't make it a personal issue or people's feelings are going to be hurt. And I, I don't think it's worth, um, alienating people or, yeah, yeah, I really don't. I I don't don't think it's worth it. I, I, I think it's awareness and it's, it is, it is an emotionally charged topic. I remember I did a uh, school lunch. I re like I overhauled an entire private school's lunch system and snacks and after school snacks for sports, the whole shebang, which, of course, I had the faculty, the administration, the school's food service. Everybody was behind me 100 uh, percent, all in agreement. 
But the last thing I had to do was present all the changes to the parents. And boy, oh boy, that was eye-opening. There were some really angry parents that uh, were upset with healthier food. And it wasn't that they were upset with healthier food. It was uh, a change that they didn't feel they their family could be successful with. I think that's what the heart of it was, that even though everybody wants to feed, and I do believe this, everybody wants to do the best for their children, feed them the healthiest food, but also let them have fun with food and enjoy all the different types of foods. If they feel that they can't implement something or something is too far of a reach, that that can be really, really hard. Yeah, I'm nodding. I'm nodding my head vigorously. I know listeners can't see that, but I totally agree with um, two points that you just made. So one is awareness. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where you feel like you can't speak up or you honestly, you don't want to speak up, I think just bringing like, you know, I had this situation, uh, another season with flag football where the snacks were kind of what I would call kind of junk food, packaged junk food. And it was my week and I brought little paper cups of berries and the other moms looked over and went, oh, my gosh, what a great idea that it never occurred to them. Mm-hmm. And it, it was almost like more powerful than sending out some kind of email that people might just be annoyed at. It was like, look, here's an alternative. And the kids were coming up for seconds and thirds. Mm-hmm. And I think that brings me to another thing that you just said about sometimes parents worry that their kids aren't aren't going to be receptive to that. And I definitely heard that from parents like, well, my kid doesn't eat fruit. And to that, I and mean, this is just this is just a soccer team snack. It's not something like you know a lunch program. But I think parents sometimes are surprised, can be surprised by their kids. And sometimes I think we don't give kids quite enough credit. We just mm-hmm. assume they want the packaged stuff. Yeah. And I've been so pleasantly surprised when, over the years, when 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 you bring out you know the the wedges of watermelon and the kids are just grabbing at them and they're cheering and they're they're excited (laughs) because it tastes good Mm -hmm. and so I think sometimes we get stuck in this well kids will only eat xyz and that's that's not the case yeah I have this motto that I use uh with my own kids and the kids I work with and the parents I work with if you lead they will follow (laughs) <laughs> they don't know how to lead. Uh, they try to lead, and oftentimes they lead, and they and they don't make good choices. They they really need a leader, and that's the parent. And and oftentimes, if you you don't even have to say anything, you just have to do it. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, uh, be that role model, do the right thing, pick the right food, and and oftentimes when you do that, children will follow. Yeah, I agree. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, your new Snacktivists handbook. Can you tell the listeners where they can find it, when, when it will be available? I know it's coming out soon, correct? Yeah, it's available now, and you can get it on realmomnutrition.com. Um, you can purchase it through there. And um, I'm just really excited about it. It has recipes in it as well. So I think it just really covers sort of all the bases of where where kids will be snacking, whether it's at home or away. So I hope that the people use it and and share their success stories with me for sure. Awesome. Awesome. And just to let everybody know, you can find Sally at realmomnutrition.com. And before we sign off, is there anything else you want people to know about? tips, suggestions, other uh, things that you have available for them should they want more information from you? Well, I'd encourage anybody to come to my Real Mom Nutrition Facebook page. It's a really great community of parents, and I post on there frequently with just different ideas or tips or questions, and it's a really great place to be and obviously visit my blog, Real Mom Nutrition. I have tons of posts about um, picky eating. I have some recipes. I have a lot about school wellness and just sort of general sort of general stories about being a mom and the frustrations and I talk about body image I kind of talk about lots of different things so Mm -hmm. I hope that I hope that people will visit me in those places well I know I do I visit every week and she has a wonderful wonderful uh, bunch of resources that are just terrific so Sally thank you so much for being on the Nourish Child podcast I really appreciate your insight and all your information and I know others do as well thanks for having me Jill you're welcome take care Okay, folks, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed 
Sally as much as I did. I'm so happy she was able to join me today on the Nourished Child podcast. Don't forget to head over and get the show notes at jillcastle.com forward slash 014. That's 014 for episode number 14. I'll have all the links and resources related to everything we talked about today in this show over there for you. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are a few things you can do to help the Nourish Child podcast grow. Write a review on iTunes, subscribe to the show on iTunes or Android, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. Or share the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, wherever you hang out, let your peers know about the Nourish Child podcast. The more parents that know about the show, the more informed and better at nourishing their child they will be. And hey, if you're not with me on Facebook, join me today. I'm at Just the Right Bite with Jill Castle. You can easily find me on Facebook. Just type in Just the Right Bite in the search box. As always, thanks for joining me today. I'm so, so very glad you are here. Please be sure to grab that little child of yours, big child, small child, athlete, not, it doesn't matter. Give that little child in your life a big squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.